terrible position. So we put Ari, our SGM. Oh. Oh. So use the marker. Sorry. Just trying to make things. Oh, and it does it again. Stupid thing. Looks like a demo jam. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, right. And if I do. Please work. Yes, it does work. Right, apologies for that mess. Me and computers. Um, so, can everyone hear me okay? Good. I'm not going to comment the title just yet, but uh, let's just ask this philosophical question, why are we here? I don't know about you, but I'm really glad to be back live at Eximal Prague 2022. It is just so cool to be here again, okay? I just wanted to say that. So more specifically, uh, so the past two years I've been uh, working in sort of a kind of a new field. Uh, and so I encountered a little something that really pissed me off to be perfectly honest. So this is sort of a rant. Um, in this day and age of uh, angle brackets and mature technologies. So, lately I've been working uh, within Product Life Management, or PLM. Um, they go around doing stuff with engineering data. You know, CAD data is also known as, and the theory is that if you have this thing called a bill of materials, which is uh, shortened bomb, and for the longest time I thought, byte order mark, what do you mean? You know, so where I came from, right? But anyway, the bomb, the bill of materials is this group of items uh, that together make up uh, a kit, a product, a something. So you can have a bomb of bombs and all kinds of stuff. I'm not really an expert, so I could be totally wrong, and I could just be lying to you, but that's not the point here. But the engineering data, so it's, these days it's used in the, all kinds of products to uh, design your product, so it will contain lists of your parts, and the groups of parts that are your you know, kits or accessories. And uh, with the right tools, you can use this engineering data to, uh, to um, uh, describe disassemblies of products and assemblies of products, which is kind of cool. So the theory being that if you're listing all of your parts, all of your kits, everything, that is a full product, whether it's a, an aeroplane or something else. Um, yeah, I mentioned that. And the really nice thing about this is that it, you know, you can do, so, so you can do your disassemblies and assemblies, you can do cool animations, you can use the engineering data to generate images, you know, uh, you know explosions of kits. You've seen those in parts list, I hope. But you can also use that data to generate XML. So you can generate your step-by-step -step instruction on how to do a disassembly of something or the other. So it's quite cool. And this is where I came in, uh, because you know I do XML and documents and angle brackets. And so the PLM world actually loves things like DITA and S1000D, because they are topic-based. Uh, so they are ideal for being the target of those conversions from a disassembly in the engineering data world to you know, a data topic, data task to be precise. 
So you can see why they like them. They actually love them. They do. And so it goes without saying that they will use these topics, these generated topics, to build documents in, in a PLM product. So they cross over to this documentation world, this XML world, where I come from. But this is also where the problems start properly now. So let me just do a really, really quick data refresher, because there's a point to that too here. Uh, I don't know if you do data, any one of you. Not a particularly exciting standard, but it's all about topics. A topic describes a single subject. So that subject could be that assembly procedure. It could be a concept that describes uh, the product. Or it could be a glossary item or something else. They're building blocks. Uh, so, and what's important is one subject equals one topic. And they all look sort of like this with some variations. There are task type topics, there are concepts, there are references, etc. Now, when you produce a document from data topics, from your building blocks, you use something known as maps. So all the organization, all the hierarchy with chapters and sections and subsections happen, all that happens in maps. If the hierarchy is it's expressed in the maps. The topics know of no such thing. So this guy here, for instance, we can see a couple of levels, section levels, chapter, section, subsection. And if you actually produce it to a PDF, the table of contents might look something like this. So just a couple of levels, really. It's a different thing, uh, but it's no different from all kinds of other similar standards. And again, I stress, topics are really building blocks because if you do a different map and you use your same topics but in a different order, in a different hierarchy, like this simple one here, well, you use them differently. So, building blocks. And they have no relation to each other. Right. Let's discuss the PLM product. Now, I'm not going to mention it by name, for obvious reasons. Uh, but let me just say that I'm not against that product as such at all. It's quite core, cool, the things it does. But the crossover to the documentation world is what sort of interests me here. On the surface of it, there's this content management feature in it. So you do all the kinds of things you would expect from ECMS. You do single source publishing using you know, XSLFO or XSLT to do HTML, etc. You have versioning and you also include management of your data maps. So you have something like this. So this is a quite nice visual presentation of a data map in this product. You can see the same structures. This is the, this, this is the data map I showed you earlier, just an example. So what's there to, not to like, right? Because there's loads of features. Well, here's the thing. This is not XML at all. So this guy here, nothing to do with XML. What happens along the way is that they actually get rid of all the angle brackets for the maps. They import the graphics because those are references to lead nodes. They do the same with topics, again lead nodes. And finally they do maps. And, <coughs> sorry about this process is known as decompose. Quite apt to me, in my mind, but yeah. And this decompose, it happens every time you bring a map into this product. 
every single time. It's a process that is done using rules. Uh, there's an unfortunate naming conventions at play there because these people are not XML people at all. They call it XML attribute mapping, which is really, really confusing because it's not XML and it's not attributes. It is mapping though. Can you see that uh, sort of, I don't know if you can see that, but the column to the right is a path, they call it. It always begins with a slash. There's an at sign, so it looks like an attribute, right? So this is, looks deceptively like an X path, except it isn't. On the left-hand side, there are database items, objects that you map this thing to. And in the middle, there's some kind of function, the thing you do when you map. The direction, for instance, if it's a decompose or a compose. And they do, there are a number of these rules to be done. They even grab the document titles using these and put those, they display those in the, the structure view we just saw. Um, so everything you do when you bring in a map needs to be described with this sort of thing. I'll discuss it in a bit because there's a lot of it. But just to remind you, remember how maps create hierarchies like this nested topic graph here, or another here, building blocks, right? So I did this experiment for, uh, this is actually a client project, but I changed the names <laughs> for obvious reasons there too. Uh, look at the final several line, lines uh, 10, 11, something. We have a section two nav title that uses uh, topic D and topic E. And this is what it looks like imported. So it seems that the maps work, mapping works quite well. So I took this second map, um, let's highlight that. It's exactly the same as the last one, except that I used one additional building block. I nested that inside topic E. So there's a topic F nested. And I imported that. And again, you get what you expect. So far, so good. Can you see this at all? Um, you can see this is my first map, so the very first one. So if I go this one here, this is what it looked like before. Then I imported map two, and it all went well. And look at what happens. Whoops, I don't want to do that. Right at the bottom. These are not building blocks. They're all related to each other in this system. Because every time I change a map, I import you know, a, a different kind of structure, a different kind of hierarchy. It, this product actually changes all the previous maps using those topics, those nested topics. Inheritance in XML, really? So what just happened? Well, and this is really my rant. We're mapping XML. Incidentally, it's called a map. And we're mapping that to a non-XML model. Happens to be a relational database. There's some kind of model there. In actual fact, the structure view you saw, it's a reused component from uh, the engineering data parts. It's more of a generic component. Someone thought it was cool to have that tree view, which it is. But those two, so the map, the map XML and the database model, they're not compatible at all. The mapping language is not very powerful. 
But what's even worse is that it really, really looks like XPath, a sort of a bastardized version of XPath. So if you're an XML person, you sort of expect that to be XML, and you want to do predicates and conditions and all kinds of stuff when you're mapping, which you cannot do. So it's quite a weak language for the job. Yet, it is something that you need to use every single time you bring in a map or you export a map. Every single time. This leads to a bunch of other problems, obviously. So, if there are, if there are things that aren't mapped to something uh, in that XML attribute mapping thing, you know, the XPath-like rules that are not XPath, things will go badly wrong. For example, in Ditter, in the Ditter book map, you can insert a talk element. Now, the talk element can be used in two ways. You can use it as a reference, so you point to an external topic that happens to be your table of contents, or you can simply use it as a placeholder. So, you know, if you place a talk element, an empty element like that one there, it just shows, yes, I do want to generate a table of contents. Thing is that the mapping language doesn't allow me to create two rules for this thing. And I cannot do a conditional rule that allows me to, you know, either treat it as a reference which is a special kind of item in the database, or just an element, an empty element that is a placeholder, which is sort of bad. Another problem that I discovered recently, you know how in Ditter you do profiling? So essentially, you just it's just a bunch of labels separated by white space. So label one, space, label two, space, label three. And it means that this particular element is applicable to these profiles. Well, uh, if you want to do a set of profiles in this product, it uses internally an array, but when you compose your map and bring out your uh, you know, XML, and bring out your profiling values, the ones that were supposed to be separated by spaces, you get comments instead. And this is just a direct result of you know, poor mapping and a, a really bad data model internally. And I could, you know, I could go on, because essentially a bad data model, well, an incompatible model at that. It, it just doesn't work if you need to go back and forth. I mean, those of you who've been doing markup for a while know that, well, this is by far not the first. Anyone remember frame plus HTML in the olden days? So FrameMaker was a really, not, it still is, by the way, is a quite good word processor, non-structured, unstructured. It was used for quite large documents. It was quite popular in the 90s. And at some point, someone thought that, yes, we need to do SGML, this new cool thing. So they did kind of a similar mapping from their non-XML, non-unstructured format to an internal rep representation of SGML, actually, and then that one they then finally mapped to SGML. It wasn't very good. Always had problems, and you always had to do that mapping. This was a long time ago, as was this one. Anyone saw this? WordPerfect did actually do SGML once upon a time. Not many knew, and it's a good thing that you didn't. Uh, more recent, maybe, some of the plugins uh, before Word, the Word document format itself became XML, 
where all these plugins for HTML and XML, they were all doing mapping at some, some level. They never worked, and so on. So, I mean, this to me is really like, you know, I used to play with Legos a lot when I was a kid. I loved them. I could build anything I want. And it sort of bothered me you know, on a certain level that when I got this boat, this shipping chip hull, and it was in three parts, it was no longer generic Lego, but it was quite useful because I could, you know, do my ships, right? And it went on from there. So the Lego pieces would become more specific to your toy and, you know, less reusable. There's apparently a Titanic in Lego, and it's probably even reu less reusable because of that. And I just, you know, recently saw this. This guy is uh, five meters or so, he's huge, made out of Lego, it's a one million pieces or something. I'm not sure about the reusability, but that probably wasn't their point, to be honest. But this represents to me what happened here with the PLM product. You uh, think you want to sell uh, Lego, but actually you just want to sell a toy, uh, be it a Harry Potter castle, which my kids loved in Lego when they were small. They built that and they were all, you know, very specialized parts. They couldn't be reused anywhere else. So there's an obvious way around all this because we already do have proper building blocks because bu the building blocks are not just, you know, the data topics and concepts and tasks and whatnot. They also, you know, the other stuff we have and they all play really nice together. So, you know, we've got XML, that's 22 years old, I believe. No, it's 24 years old, sorry. Uh, so it should be quite mature. Similarly, there are loads of sister standards. You know, XSLT is only 20 years old. There's been several new versions. There's XForms and there's XProc. And there are XML databases and XQuery. And you've got mature vocabularies and you've got tool support for all of it. So uh, this is really my point. Why would anyone want to do something other than XML when you know you you should use XML? Thank you. Thank you, Ari. Any question or remarks? Okay, I think everybody wants to go to lunch, it seems. Good Thank choice. you, Harry. Then. Thank you. So just a few information. So lunch is in the same place as yesterday, if you were.